Welcome back for those of you who were just uh, online with us uh, praying the rosary. I pray that uh, you enjoyed the poem If by Roger Kipling. If you've never read it, I highly encourage you to read it. You can Google it. I really like the version when Sir Michael Caine reads it, so you might want to Google that. Uh, it's very encouraging in this trying time. I know many people have asked me to pray for them, and I am praying, and I'm asking for your prayers as well. So um, today's gospel reading, uh, we're talking about for this coming Sunday, which of course is August 2nd, and it's hard to believe that we are already in August. And um, it is truly uh, one of my favorite gospel passages. It is also unique because it and the resurrection are really the only um, miracles that are listed in all four Gospels. So the miracle that we're talking about today, of course, is the feeding of the 5,000. And so it is a beautiful, beautiful reading. And I'm going to uh, go a little deep in it and tell you um, some uh, reflection about what Christ is really uh, leading up to, which of course is the Eucharistic meal. And of course that involves his crucifixion. Um, and so I wanna just give you a little history background of where this takes place. Place. So this is a map of the Holy Land, and um, if you come with me sometime when we can go back, we'll go there. But we're way up here, uh, and it takes place up in Galilee, and uh, it's at what, what is called Tabga, which means the seven uh, fountains or the uh, or the seven springs, and they found six of those. But uh, what happens uh, here? It's about two miles west of Capernaum, which of course was Jesus's hometown, where Peter's house was, and where Jesus uh, did his ministry up north there in Galilee. But Tabga has these uh, springs that spring up in the Sea of Galilee, and it, and because of the warm springs, what happens is algae grows and all these fish come. So this is a very fitting place for the people to have gathered. It's, you know, a part of the fishing village. They believe that's probably where Jesus called uh, most of the 12 disciples was right here. And, um, and there's a beautiful Byzantine church there called the Church of the Multiplication, so, or Tabka. So, um, so just kind of picture this beautiful rural place, right? near the Sea of Galilee, and we'll see that the Lord asks um, the people, and there's many, many, many um, people that have gathered. So we'll get right into it, and um, we'll read this now, and just picture in your mind the beautiful placid lake and the green hill that the people were all um, on, and Christ taking a little boat over there, and so he was on the shore probably and walked up a bit of a way, and, and then this took place. So um, so today's gospel uh, message I've entitled, You Plus God is Enough. And uh, I don't know if you are feeling that right now, but we'll be praying that, that the Lord make this very evident in your life, because the beautiful thing about grace is it comes in the moment and he always gives us just what we need in the moment. So, um, so uh, don't uh, let the enemy's lies get you down, all right? So here we go. So uh, if you'd like to stand, uh, today's uh, reading is taken from Matthew 14, 13 through 21, for those of you that like to turn in your scriptures. Um, and if you'd like to stand, please do. So a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus heard of it, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. The crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowds, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted place, and it is already late. Dismiss the crowds so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, there is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, bring them to me. And he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied. 
and they picked up the fragments left over, 12 wicker baskets full. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so I wanna quickly point out the first two things and then we'll get into the third thing. But the first thing that we read is that Jesus is, uh, it, he hears about this thing. Well, what he hears about, what we've been reading about the last week in the Bible is really about uh, John the Baptist. He, he hears about John the Baptist's beheading. And so Jesus uh, then, then is sad. So he hops in a boat to kind of get away. And, you know, Jesus and John were cousins. And so we see this very uh, human response. We get a glimpse of Jesus's humanity. And so he goes to be with, in the quiet and stillness with his father and to get away. And I, my question for you is, where do you go? Where do you go when you are hit by something, when the world sort of, you know, meets you face to face and, and you become um, maybe overwhelmed with grief or sadness or, or some other very human emotion, what do you do with it? And if we're like Christ, then we, we can go and take a moment apart and be with our Heavenly Father. And it is a beautiful way to handle loss and disappointment because there God will revive and recharge us. So if you need to go on a retreat, even from your own home, there are all kinds of beautiful retreats online. I highly recommend this. Um, and just know that the Father meets you there and Jesus has experienced what you have experienced and he will meet you there. So the best way to get revived and recharged is to, is to step away and to meet with the Father like Christ. Okay, so then the second thing that we see, and which you may experience as well, is that the crowds hear where Jesus is going, and so they head over to that destination, and they basically beat him to where he's going. This is just two miles on foot, so Jesus probably went out in the boat and was having a nice little sail, and when he gets over to Tabka, the crowds are already there. It's just a two-mile walk from Capernaum, just a little ways basically from um, what we'd call civilization. But anyway, he's, uh, he's there and he thinks he's gonna have a moment of peace only to get off, to disembark, and to be met by a sea of humanity. And uh, I don't know about you, but this happens to me quite often. Um, I'll just settle down to read a book and suddenly everybody, I'm, in needed by, I'm needed by everybody on the planet, including the animals in my house, the dog, the cat, wh whatever it is. It seems like everybody needs me in my moment. Um, and this can lead to anger and frustration um, or exasperation. But let's pray to be more like Jesus. Instead of being, you know, exasperated, what happens? He's moved to pity, uh, even when his plans are interrupted. And so let's ask the Lord that when our plans are interrupted, which they so often are, just on a moment by moment basis, if you have family, or even if you don't, um, let's pray to have a heart of compassion like Jesus. And if you don't know the word compassion, literally means suffering with. Com means with, passion means suffering. So to have a heart that's moved to suffer with those, to have pity, to have mercy. And so let's pray to be like Jesus meek and humble of heart, to make our hearts more like him because Jesus gives us just what we need in the moment, uh, which is by his grace, which leads me to the third, um, to the third point, which is of course talking about the feeding of the 5,000. So we get this three times, um, uh, this idea of feeding large crowds at least three times in the Old Testament, miracle, uh, we, we should say miracle multiplications of food. And of course, the first one that comes to mind is manna coming from heaven and feeding the children of Israel in the desert. The second one is um, Elijah. Many people remember the story of Elijah and the widow of, um, of Zarephath, which is a very hard word to say, but the food just never ran out. The, the, the flour and the oil never ran out. And then his predecessor, his, uh, his protege, uh, Elisha, then feeds a hundred men with 20 loaves of bread. So we have had in the past by these greats, you know, we would say Moses, Elijah, Elisha, 
the feeding. And so this is in the minds of the people when Christ does this miracle. Now, because the setup for this has been the death of John the Baptist, and we know that John preceded Christ in all ways. He, he went before the Lord. So not only did he precede him in life, now we see this foreshadowing of him preceding, preceding him in death. So in Christ's mind, what he's seeing here, not only is he going to be a prophet that's greater, of course, than these Old Testament prophets, but he's seeing his own his own journey ahead that was preceded by John the Baptist. So all the language that he uses here in, in what he does is Eucharistic language. And we'll see the only other time that this is ever used in the New Testament is at the Eucharistic meal, at the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to see those four words that, that are used. And so the other things that are similar then, not only are the four words used, here are some other similar similarities about at the Eucharistic meal, what happened. So they both took place in the evening. This is in the evening, the people, and that's why the disciples want to dismiss them before it gets dark. Uh, both stories, he has, the people are reclining, the disciples are reclining at a table. He has the people recline then on this green grass, as Mark says. And then he uses this Eucharistic language. And the four words are took, blessed, broke, and gave. And we see that he has this at the Eucharistic meal. And then he does, he hands it to the exact same people. So here he hands it to the disciples for them to go and feed the people. And at the Eucharistic meal, he does, he hands it to the same group of 12. And of course, eventually they will go and take the physical body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and they will serve than the world with it, just as we are to do. And so uh, let's look at this closer. So first his disciples do what I would have done when they come, they're like, uh, Jesus, it's dark, people are hungry, they need to go home, they need to feed themselves and um, go away, you know? And But Jesus always has a better plan and he's so much more gracious and um, hospitable. And he says, hey guys, why don't you feed them yourselves? And of course, <clears throat> what Christ is doing is he's showing them that they can't do it by themselves. So he's pointing this out very plainly, but he also shows that he wants our active participation in what he can do. So uh, we, we learn um, to say yes. And I love this phrase that our obedience is on the other end of someone else's miracle. Our yes, our fiat to what God asks us to do is on the other end of someone else's miracle. And so we get to be active participants in what God does in this world, which I just love to be an active participant. And it, we know, though, it's by his grace. It's at his invitation. It's his initiation. It's always an initiation of God's grace. And we just get to say yes to it and participate in it because he loves us and he wants us to be active participants in the kingdom work. And so how wonderful and fun is that? We get to be kingdom builders with Christ. And so he says, um, I think so many times to, to me, he says, you can do this. And I think to myself, no, no, I can't. And God says, oh, yes, you can with me. And so if you ever feel like you are not enough, guess what? In and of yourself, you are not. But with God, you are plenty. And that's what this miracle shows. So uh, we, get to, we get to be active participants. Uh, we get to help to be miracles in other people's lives. And that is just what happens here. So... Um, so the disciples want to send them away thinking that the people can get something that they need apart from Jesus. And I love this part. Jesus is like, guess what? They can't. I can give them all they need. And so if you, my friends, think that you can get something that you need apart from Jesus, you're wrong. Jesus can give you all that you need. Jesus is all that we need. And so thanks be to God that we have a God who not only can, but will meet all of our needs. And um, so he's all we need. So he's going to show them how he can supply them and not just with a little food. And I love this about Jesus. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Basically in comparison to what Jesus has, everything Jesus does is always in super abundance 
super abundance, all right? So get that again and again. We can do what we think is something, but compared to what Christ can do, it's nothing because everything Christ does is in super abundance. It's lavish, lavish grace, lavish love, lavish, lavish giving, lavish mercy, lavish forgiveness. All that God gives us is in super abundance. I love that. And so this is what we're going to see. So um, so the question is, why don't you feed them? Shows the disciples their, their utter lack. And uh, it, it makes them realize they can't fix the problem apart from Jesus. But just like with them, he never asks us to do it by ourselves. We try. But only Jesus can give us the super abundant fruit in our lives and what we need in order to serve him, the grace and the mercy. And because he is super abundance itself, he is lavishness itself. So next, the disciples give an account to Jesus of why this won't work. <laughs> I love this. Um, they give him excuses. All right. And how many times in our own life we're like, uh, you know what, God, let me tell you the reality here. Let me give you the reality. The reality is this. And I love that God takes our reality and he says, oh, really? You think that's lack? You think that's not good enough? Your reality, I've given you your reality. Let me come into your reality and make your reality a super abundant blessing to many. All right, so here goes. So he brings them and he says, bring, bring your reality to me. And so their reality is these few loaves and fishes. And, and again, he's asking for their active participation <clears throat> and their faith to bring them what they have, not just to throw their hands up in exasperation and walk away. But he says, bring it to me. And so out of obedience, they do. And, um, you know, he gets them involved, which he does us too. And he wants us to be involved in this kingdom building work and in feeding his sheep. All right. And so um, he starts with whatever we give him. We give him a little he can, he can increase. So whatever you have, bring it to the Lord, bring it to him. So he gave orders to have the people sit down on the grass and Mark calls it green grass. So we get this 23rd Psalm in imagery of the good shepherd having the sheep sit on the green grass by the quiet waters. And so how beautiful is this? So we see this beautiful David imagery, the Psalm Im imagery of what Christ is about to do. And he's, he's going to prepare a banquet before them. And so the Lord is our shepherd. There is nothing we shall lack. In green pastures, he makes us lie down. By still waters, he leads us and he restores our soul. And he gives us all we need. So we're going to see that right here and how the Lord does it every day for us as Catholics is at Mass in the Eucharistic meal, through prayer, through scripture reading, we have all that we need. So having had them set down, um, 10, 15, 20,000 people, so imagine a football stadium full worth of people, that's a lot of people to feed, all right? And it's an astonishing miracle. I think he had them sit down so that they could see just how many people he was about to feed. Um, and then uh, he, he does it. Now, the only other time uh, that I've ever seen something like this happen, I was at the USCCB convocation a few years back in Florida, and there was a room that fed two, was able to feed 2,000 people at one time. And I have to say, I was completely overwhelmed at the amount of food, tables, chairs, and staff it took to feed 2,000 people. Well, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to hear what Jesus did. And he did it with just a tiny bit of food and only 12 people. So here it goes. I think the serving part of it might have been as great a miracle as the giving it out. Just amazing. If you've ever um, had a dinner party, just imagine this one. All right. So then we read that he, he takes this. And in the taking, he takes the five loaves and the two fish. And then he looks up to heaven. And this is how Jesus would pray is looking up to heaven and with his eyes focused on the Father, the giver of all good things, uh, set on things above, not on things below. So I think that is the, the first key is once we take and give ourselves to the Lord, it becomes a heavenly work. It becomes his work. So we don't focus on our, on our limitations. 
We don't focus on what we think is our reality, but we get a new mindset, a new vision, and we look up to heaven and we get the eyes of the Lord looking upon us. And then this blessing comes down. So when we look up to the Lord, this blessing comes down. Jesus blesses the food. He probably did the traditional Jewish blessing of blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. That may very well have been the blessing that Christ used here. Very simple, very humble, very trusting, very thankful for what the Lord has given and provided. And then he takes it and he breaks it. And, and then in the breaking of the loaves, then he gave out. And I love this word gave. It's an active verb and it means he kept giving. He kept giving and giving and giving. And so I love that the Lord, that's how he deals with us. He, it's not a one and done. It's a moment by moment. We give ourselves to him. He blesses us. He breaks us. And he just keeps giving and giving and giving what we need in order never to have our well run dry. And so they all ate and were satisfied. The Lord gives again in super abundance. And they picked up the fragments left over 12 wicker baskets full. Now the leftovers far exceed the beginning, the, the amount that they had at the beginning. And this is the secret of kingdom work. And I just love this about God. He always, when we do God's kingdom work, because it's not us that's doing it, it's the, 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 the divine favor of the Lord, the blessing flowing through us, we actually end up usually in a far better spot than where we started because we have been replenished, we've been restored. And one of my favorite facts, and you know, I wrote this book called Born to Soar about the monarch butterfly. One of my favorite, favorite facts about the monarch is that it doesn't fly in its own strength. It soars on the drafts, the, the, the thermal currents. And how we know that it doesn't use its own fat stores is because it actually weighs more when it gets to Mexico than when it left Canada which means that it's not soaring in its own strength, but all along the way, it's just gaining weight <laughs> because it has to winter over. It has more work to do. And that's how the Lord deals with us. If we don't do it in our own strength, we're just gonna keep gaining the graces of the Lord. And we're gonna weigh more at the end than we did in the beginning. And that's what, exactly what this shows. There's more left over, far, far more left over. And of course, this number 12, equates to the number of the disciples, which of course equates to the 12 tribes, meaning everyone's welcome. Everyone should come. He's got enough food for everyone. Everyone is welcome in the kingdom. And so uh, uh, it, it, it is hearkening back then to, to all of this beautiful Old Testament imagery. And so uh, this Last Supper imagery, and I wanna just quote now from Henry Nouwen, and if you've never read Henry Nouwen, please, please look this up. And he talks about the institution of the Eucharist, and he states this, when Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, he summarized in these gestures his own life. Jesus is chosen from all eternity, blessed at his baptism in the Jordan River, broken on the cross and given as bread to the world being chosen blessed broken and given is the sacred journey of the son of god jesus christ when we take bread bless it break it and give it with the words this is the body of christ we express our commitment to make our lives conform to the life of christ we too want to live as people chosen, blessed and broken, and thus become food for the world. So I just am going to end with a little personal story. Not so long ago, my entire family came uh, for a family reunion and they were, they were coming and I was already exhausted before they even arrived. Uh, and I felt like I just getting prepared, I had nothing left for when they were going to get there. I had no strength left. And I went to bed praying uh, for strength and the ability to be able to do all the Lord was asking of me and to do it well and to love them well. 
And then the strangest thing happened uh, that evening, that night. And I'm not sure if I was awake or asleep, if it was a dream or what it was exactly. But these beautiful hands uh, came down from heaven and picked me up and comforted me. And then he put one hand over the other and I was completely enclosed in his beautiful hands. And he blessed me and he told me just to rest in him. At that moment, I turned into a piece of bread in this dream and he began breaking me into little pieces. But it didn't hurt at all. Actually, I was watching from the outside of his hands and it was beautiful. And then he began to feed my family from the bread in his hands. All I had to do was be willing to cooperate. As long as I did not squirm or object, there was plenty and it was painless, funny and even delightful, even to be able to be used to feed so many people with no effort on my part at all, except to be still and to rest in his hands. It was so sweet to be able to be used to strengthen others in that way. I remember especially my mom went up and I saw the beautiful smile on her face as God placed a piece of bread in her mouth. And all I could do was smile, feeling so honored that God would choose to use me to feed his beloved. Then I woke up, I guess, and I totally got what he wanted to say to me. He wanted for me to rest in him and enjoy letting him use me to feed them. This is my body broken for you. He wanted me to be his body to my family, literally. So I rested in him knowing he could do what I could not. He allowed me to keep on giving even when my own stores were useless and, and used up. All I needed to do was to rest in him. If I did anything in my own strength, it stopped, it ran out. But as long as it remained in his hands and let him portion me out, it just kept being enough. I never ran out because it was not really me at all. It was him doing this crazy miracle through me. I got to be actively participating in what God was doing for others through me. So you may find yourself in a similar situation in this COVID season. So many at home, all sheltering together, all needing to be fed. You might have had different plans for this summer, like sneaking off to a deserted place to get away, only to have all of your plans canceled and needing to stay home with many, many people all needing you at once. Instead of getting exasperated and saying, I'm done, it's time for you all to go back to your places now. Uh, you are dismissed, go feed yourselves. Ask the Lord to make what little you may have enough by bringing your whole self to him, even if it ain't much. And ask for him to take you just as you are so little and not enough in your own self to bless you to give you the desire and the strength to abandon yourself totally to him to break you and this might mean to break your will to die to your own plans your own dreams your own vacation your own ideas even your own time and then to give you out this might even be to ungrateful, thankless, entitled, and selfish people. But knowing this is who Christ feeds every day. And sometimes that person might even be you. We get to be most like Christ when we are most like Christ. And then the superabundance happens. We never run out because we are not doing it to please ourselves or even in our own strength, but only to be one with him.
and yippee, we get to be one with Jesus. And now that, I believe, that one lesson is worth being in all four Gospels, don't you? The secret of oneness with our Lord. So, may you be taken, blessed, broken, and given, and may each and every time you are, you experience the super abundance in your soul that can only come from being held and used in the hands of our Lord. Because you plus God are more than enough. Let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask that by your grace, we would be willing to be active participants, that we would bring you ourselves so that we can be taken, blessed, broken, and given out to a hungry world, to our hungry friends, to our hungry neighbors, to our hungry family, to our hungry spouse, to our hungry children. Lord, take us now, we pray. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. I'll be praying for you. Happy August coming up just tomorrow. Read God's holy word. Hope you can turn in next week and be encouraged by the word. God bless you.